what I'm going to demonstrate here, but uh, Mutz did a great example of it. Uh, DEF CON, the NNM exploit. Uh, if you go with DEF CON 15, what's next? 16, okay, so uh, Bug to Zero Day uh, is the name of the talk uh, from DEF CON. There's a great video on using an egg hunter and how you can basically make a computer hack itself. Now, how big are some of the stages that we made exploit that are already there for being small payloads to grab the rest of the payload? It would work normally, but again, this is such a poorly written just example exploit to get the basic <coughs> concepts down, it won't work with this. Um, they are usually less than 250 characters, or 250 bytes. Um, now, another exploit that I've worked on only had 60 bytes available for shellcode, which I still haven't figured out how I'm going to work around that. I've talked to Dave about that a little bit, but that's incredibly small. That's a very, very limited amount for shellcode. Like, even uh, a basic ad user shellcode is like 255 bytes. Uh, a reverse shell is up at about seven or 800 bytes. Um, the cool thing about this app and that fuzzer, if you play with the fuzzer a little bit, there are a lot of vulnerabilities in this app in a lot of different places. So uh, there's one built into Metasploit for this application. It's a little bit better. Um, there's also a lot on the exploit database, um, which I've got up here in a minute. Um, go ahead and talk about how the world isn't as happy as it should be. Microsoft kind of started getting pissed at people, breaking all their stuff all the time. So they started adding stuff in like address space randomization, which would keep you from doing what we just did there with the uh, address, because every time you reboot Windows, those modules would load in different places. So user 32 is not necessarily going to be there every time. But they kind of half-assed it a little bit, so they only, uh, only the first two bytes are randomized after that. Uh, it's still going to be in the same place. So there is some, some cool shell code out there that you can use. It'll search for those modules and it, you can do some nuts, some pretty crazy stuff. If you guys are into that, I'll go ahead and pop that real quick. Offsec's cracking the perimeter course. Uh, the guys that do backtrack, um, that class is crazy. It is the hardest thing I've ever done. I had no excellent <coughs> development experience four months ago. I never looked at shell code. I never looked at assembly. Um, and I, I enrolled in the course, took it. Uh, you will write three zero days in the course uh, using manually encoded shell code, you'll write your own shell code, uh, you'll do a lot, you'll bypass, uh, you'll bypass DEP and ASLR, uh, which are both prevention techniques to keep a lot of these type of tactics from working these days. Um, I can't say enough about it. I know Dave also has taken part of the course, taken the course, and he recommended it to me, and you agree with what I said, it's one of the craziest classes out there. Mutz is a madman. Except for all. Well, yeah. There's uh, the Advanced Windows Exploitation, which I'm hoping to take uh, out of DEF CON this year, or uh, Blackout. But, uh, yeah, DEP and ASLR and SLR will randomize uh, address spaces. Uh, it's enabled in Vista and Server 08 by default, not enabled in uh, XP. And then uh, DEP will prevent you from executing code in non-executable parts of memory. Uh, again, kind of a half-assed attempt. There's a lot of ways around it way beyond the scope of this talk. Um, slides and demos will be on nullthread.net. I'll try to remember to put everything up there. Guys, if I forget something, <coughs> put something in the comment. Email me nullthread at nullthread.net. Find me on Twitter, nullthread. If I forgot something, I forget a lot. Like, I forget I'm here right now. So uh, <laughs> tell me what you want. Tell me if you guys need help. Uh, I'll help you as much as I can. People that are far smarter than me, Corlan, uh, it's kind of a weird address, but Get to his stuff. He has a nine-part series on writing exploits, going from as basic as I did here today, maybe a little bit more basic than what I did here today, all the way up to some of the more advanced techniques. Completely free, completely out there. Um, goes in more in depth about the registers, what they mean, what they do. Uh, DHA at Enclave Forensics, Dave Holzer, SANS instructor, I just got out of his auditing course uh, last week, has a series on YouTube about buffer overflows. See, I don't, I'm not big into the reading and <coughs> learning. I'd much rather watch the moving pictures. So uh, his YouTube channel, he's got a uh, five or six part series on uh, doing fuzzing, doing buffer overflows, very similar to what I did here, but taking an exploit that's not written for uh, Metasploit and porting it into Metasploit. I used it quite a bit because, like I said, this is my first attempt <coughs> at bringing stuff into Metasploit. I will definitely be doing it a lot more. It is incredible. And the exploit database. As you guys keep going with this stuff, Something that helped me a lot, going 
going in there, finding older exploits, uh, especially for some of the stuff they've got links to the applications that are broken, and you take a you take the code, run it, you try to put it in different shell code. What I like to do is go in, erase it, make it just a skeleton exploit, and try to go through the whole thing myself. I know this program's vulnerable. I want to fuzz it. I want to find out why it's vulnerable. I want to figure out all the pieces. So uh, that helps me personally. I don't know if that would do it for you guys. Um, <coughs> questions? Yes? With virtual memory uh, addressing mm -hmm. and how it takes each stack out basically, it pulls out this bit. When you do overwriting, how are you repointing the ESP on a different application sitting in a whole other virtual memory address? So how is it pulling out the ESP from me? A separate, basically, you're going out of this virtual memory address into this virtual memory address. What, what do you get? You go ahead. No. You understand it better than I do. What do you understand with applications is when they when they create a stack and everything like that, it's a separate you know portion of an allocated memory, and it's always going to be the same memory address regardless of whether it's a virtual machine or, or different types of memory space. So it doesn't make a difference. The addresses will always be the same. Well, not a virtual machine, but virtual memory address. Where it, doesn't it take a stack? Is that what you're or is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so it'll 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 take it'll take the stack. It'll always be the same memory address. Oh, so you, every single four. Okay, so it holds all of Windows and everything <coughs> with it to find out the information. Yep. It's not just that single application. No. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it isn't. It isn't. I mean, like user thirty two DLL is always going to typically be used within an application or shell thirty two DLL or kernel thirty two DLL. Yeah, kernel would be probably used. Been better when you use for this. Yeah, all, all of them will be used when an application loads. So it'll all be within that application's memory space, even though it's you know a DLL for a, for a Windows operating system. And they'll always be the same memory. So if, trying, so if I was trying to hit another application that I know is running on that system, like if I was hitting the FTP and I was trying to move over to another application I know is running, I could move out that virtual memory address into that application. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Metasploit does that actually with the migrate process. So it'll actually hook its um, information and its you know, memory address space into another application memory address space. So, yeah, actually, uh, so, I mean, yeah, absolutely. So, like, wh for example, like, whenever I'm exploiting um, and I, you know, get a interpreter shell, the first thing I'll do is I'll migrate to, like, explore IDC or something like that, move my memory address space into there. And the interpreter prides itself on and never touches the disk. So everything it does is all done in memory. So, yeah, absolutely, you move, you move your, uh, all of your, your payload information over to another process. And then if you're running on something that's, you know, system-based, like explore IDC, um, or LSAS or stuff like that. You can actually do keystroke logging on the system itself and a bunch of other stuff. So, I mean, it all depends on what you want to do with it. <coughs> right, so I got I got one more demo I'm going to do real fast. Um, show you this. I haven't ported this into uh, Metasploit yet. This is what uh, one that uh, Martin and I did coming back from the escape from DC. <laughs> we uh, went to ShmooCon uh, and. I don't know if any of you heard. It got a little bit of snow while we were there. Uh, it was like 30-something inches of snow in 48 hours. Uh, we all had flights trying to get out of there. Nobody could get out. So uh, my boss, John, and I decided to drive back. Somehow ended up with uh, Adrian, a very hungover Adrian. <laughs> and uh, he picked up his hand to something to drink. Say no. Yeah, say no. <laughs> Otherwise, you have neon green vomit on the interstates. <laughs> and, uh, and Martin uh, rode back with us. Martin had gotten uh, this off of the exploit database, right? It was a proof of concept. Uh, it was denial of service at the time. Uh, nobody had gotten shell off of this uh, vulnerability. It was denial uh, of service on, on Linux Explorer. Oh, was it? Okay, so we poured it. I wasn't sure because you had it before I got a hold of it. Right, I started messing with it on Windows and overrode it. And then yeah, and then I, I took over a little bit because I just gotten out of that class and uh, had some uh, had some fun with it. Um, as you see here, somebody else discovered it, posted it out on the web. Um, as I was talking about earlier, the shell code. Here's the shell code um, that you would have to bring in and then. It basically builds a packet. I'm not going to get into it too deep. It's on uh, exploit database uh, for Wireshark 125. Yeah, 125. Yeah, um, which I have running over here. And if you guys didn't know, there's a lot of vulnerabilities throughout time in uh, <coughs> Wireshark because they have all those interpreters that try to make make pretty pictures for you so that you can see them. I like that, but uh, it it can be vulnerable and. I know we run it a lot at our uh, at our office. So it's, I'll show you guys the danger. Of